encounter that I had with childhood lead exposure was actually when I was an undergrad at Brown in the 1990s. Um, I had a work study job um, uh, helping to test uh, soil and water samples from mostly low income neighborhoods around Providence, Rhode Island for lead. Um, and so I learned a bit at the time about how prevalent lead exposure was and how damaging that it was to um, especially small children who, with their still developing brains. So it was kind of in the back of my mind. Um, it wasn't my main focus of study. I went off to graduate school and studied forest soils. Um, but then in 2000, a guy called Rick Nevin published a, an environmental paper um, about the impacts of leaded gasoline, especially on Generation X. Right, those of us born in the 60s and 70s were exposed to a lot of lead and uh, Rick Nevin argued, had a lot of really negative consequences from that later on. So we know that being exposed to lead in childhood, especially early childhood, um, harms your learning and memory and impulse control. And Rick Nevin showed that there are these clear trends, the rise and then fall of leaded gasoline is followed about 20 years later. If you let all those lead exposed babies and toddlers grow up into young adults um, by a similar rise and fall in um, high school dropout rates, uh, unwanted pregnancies and violent crime. Violent crime was the most sort of dramatic of these trends. Um, and, and that made perfect sense to me, right? Something that harms your brain in such a way that you don't learn as well, you don't control your impulses as well, that's gonna nudge people in the direction that would potentially lead to more violent crime when they um, become teenagers or young adults. So I read this paper back in 2000 and it really changed my view of the last half century of American history, right? All these trends in social outcomes that were clearly influenced by this massive lead exposure during the height of the burning of leaded gasoline. So I was like, all right, that's how things work. And I kind of readjusted my thinking about things based on that. And then about six years ago, um, I was actually, I remember this, uh, I was on a hike with some other members of the senior minister search committee. Uh, normally, when I tell this story, I'm like, with some very well-educated and well-informed friends of mine, but these are folks you guys know. And um, and we were talking about violent crime. And I was like, and of course, there's all that lead poisoning. And some of them had never heard of that connection. Some of them had never heard this argument that one of the factors that has led to the massive changes we've seen over the past half century in rates of violent crime was this huge change in rates of childhood lead exposure. And I thought, I should write a book. So that was six years ago. It took a long time uh, to, for this to come to fruition. Um, but I learned a lot along the way. I learned a lot of things. And one of the things that I learned is just how really severely lead poisoned my generation was. Um, I hadn't really thought carefully about the numbers until I started researching this book. But um, for those of you who aren't that familiar with childhood lead exposure, um, we typically measure uh, the lead in children's blood um, to see how much lead they've been exposed to. It's measured in micrograms per deciliter. I don't know why they use such a strange unit, but that's what they do. And um, right now, the, uh, the um, reference level that the CDC uses for kind of the cutoff when intervention is necessary is five, five micrograms per deciliter. So when I took my kids, when they turned one to have their blood tested for lead, if they had come back at five micrograms per deciliter, um, the pediatrician would have worked with us to try to figure out what the source of lead poisoning might be, to address any potential sources in the house or the school or around the area. Uh, they would have been retested again a few months later to make sure that we had addressed the problem. Uh, we know that five is harmful. And in fact, there's a lot of research to suggest that 
even two or three micrograms per deciliter is associated with some of these cognitive and behavioral harms that I was talking about. But five, five is definitely bad. Back in the 1970s, when I was a little kid, all little kids in America had a blood lead level of five or higher. There was a representative national study of thousands of kids across the country. 99.8% of those kids came back at five or higher. There were a couple of fours, nothing under four. Across all the kids they looked at in this nationally representative sample of thousands of kids, right? And so we were all lead poisoned. Now, if I took my kids to be tested when they turned one and their level came back at 20 or higher, that's considered an emergency. They would be sent to the hospital for further testing. They probably wouldn't be allowed to go home at all until the source of the lead had been found and addressed. Um, most likely a, a social worker would get involved and work with the family to address the problem and um, find out what kinds of interventions the kids needed to deal with this emergency level of lead poisoning. That's at 20, right? In this nationally representative sample in the 1970s, one in four American kids was a 20 or higher. One in four kids across the country. And for black kids, it was half. Fully half of the black kids in America, when I was a little kid, had this level of lead in their blood that we now consider an emergency, right? If kids have that level today. So I just hadn't hadn't like fully realized the level and ubiquity of lead poisoning of my generation. The other thing that really struck me as I was doing the research for this book is how strong the evidence is for a connection between childhood lead exposure and violent crime. Um, as I was talking with people early in the process of writing this book, I, I got a lot of skepticism, like lead isn't what causes crime. There are all these other factors that cause crime. It's not lead. And of course, violent crime is a very complex, you know, social issue that has many factors that influence it. Nobody's arguing that it's just lead, but it's very clearly partly lead. We know that, um, lead harms the developing brain. We know that from human and animal studies. And we also have animal studies that show increased aggression, right? And the nice thing about an animal study is you can control everything else. So we know it's the lead. It's not that some of these animals grew up in a bad neighborhood or something, right? They were all raised under the same conditions except lead. And the ones that were raised with lead show higher rates of aggression. But in humans, we have this big correlational study that Rick Nevin did, right? And people always say correlation doesn't prove causation, which is so true. But we also can see that same correlation between rising and falling exposure to lead. 20 years later, you see rising and falling rates of violent crime in different countries, in different states in the United States. It turns out that lead was removed from gasoline at different times in different states, just because of how the refineries were. The ones that got the lead out sooner 20 years later, had a drop in violent crime sooner than the states that had lead in their gasoline launder. Um, you see this same correlation at the city level, at neighborhoods within cities. Plus, you can see it in individuals. There are prospective and retrospective and case control studies, um, all of which point to a statistically significant relationship between being exposed to lead as a kid and the rate of violent crime. Um, later on. And I think a lot of Americans don't realize that between the sort of mid 90s and the mid 2010s, the violent crime rates in this country dropped by half or more, depending on which database you're looking at. And not all of that can be attributed to getting the lead out of gasoline, but that was certainly one of the factors that made a difference. And as we think about environmental issues and the importance of reducing our exposure to toxins, I think in addition to thinking about physical health, it's really important to think about these mental behavioral outcomes, right? Toxins affect our brain. In fact, brains are one of the most sensitive body parts to responding to any kind of insult, including toxins. And so as we think about future environmental issues, making the world 
safer and saner is a pretty good reason to try to um, reduce our exposure to toxins. So I learned a lot about how lead poisoning were and how strong a connection there is between uh, lead poisoning and violent crime. I also learned some interesting history. And this is the, the little section of the book that I want to read to you guys, because one of the questions people always ask me is, well, didn't they know? When we started putting lead in gasoline, didn't they know that was a bad idea? And um, I kind of went into this thinking, well, they probably didn't realize it. They were doing the best they could, right? They, they maybe didn't have the data or whatever, but it turns out a lot of people did know, right? And, and there really was a lot of good information about how harmful lead is. We've known that lead is toxic for thousands of years. So in the 1920s, when people said, hey, let's put a bunch of lead in gasoline, not everybody thought that was a good idea. So I'm gonna read you a little section from chapter two, uh, which is called Where the Lead Came From. Uh, that's mostly about the, the sort of rise of leaded gasoline. So it talks about the problem that leaded gasoline was intended to address, which is this problem of knocking, right? So in an internal combustion engine, um, if your gas is too prone to explode without you know, a spark plug setting it off, it explodes at the wrong time in the wrong location, not only makes your engine a lot less efficient and powerful, but also can destroy your engine over time. So that's knocking, right? Really bad. Um, in the 1920s, more people are buying cars. They wanna build bigger, faster, more powerful cars, but they've got this problem with knocking. And they know that what they need to do is they need to raise the octane of gasoline. Octane is how we measure the ability of gasoline to resist this tendency to explode when it's not supposed to. And they already knew that there were a bunch of ways you can raise the octane. Uh, you can do a process called thermal cracking, but it's fairly expensive to implement the equipment for that. You can add ethanol, uh, which is just you know regular gasoline like vodka. Um, but the General Motors wanted to find their own way of addressing this problem. So a guy called Thomas Midgley has been working on this problem, tries all these different compounds. Some of them don't work. Some of them are super expensive. One of them was just too stinky. Like it legitimately just smelled bad. While the lab was working on this one, um, Mrs. Midgley made Thomas sleep on the couch because he came home so stinky from work every day. But they're still working on it. They're trying to figure it out. And then they come across a chemical called tetraethyl lead, right? Which is basically just an organic form of lead. Just speak English. Just like that, General Motors had an anti-knock additive that was cheap, effective, and most importantly, from a corporate perspective, patentable. Adding tetraethyl lead, TEL, to gasoline would allow GM to double the compression ratios of its engines, allowing them to build the bigger, faster, more powerful cars they'd been hoping for. General Motors and Standard Oil eventually got together and created a company called the Ethel Corporation to sell this new product. It was a stroke of marketing genius that they called their new gasoline additive Ethel, carefully leaving out any reference to lead, which was already associated with toxicity in many people's minds. The Ethel Corporation hired the DuPont Company to manufacture TEL, and they got to work scaling up production. From the beginning, some of those involved in the development of TEL had concerns about its safety. In 1922, DuPont was run by two brothers, and one brother wrote to the other brother that their new product, TEL, was, quote, very poisonous if absorbed through the skin, resulting in lead poisoning almost immediately. One of Thomas Midgley's co-workers, Tabby Boyd, later said that, quote, from the outset, it was appreciated that putting tetraethyl lead into gasoline might possibly introduce a health hazard. The first opinions of the doctors who were consulted were full of such frightening phrases as grave fears distinct risk and widespread lead poisoning. The source of the possible hazard to health thought of at first was not so much that from the tetraethyl lead itself as from the finely divided lead dust in engine exhaust. So they had that right. In addition, Kettering's lab received letters from numerous public health and toxicology experts expressing their concerns about TEL. Midgley himself suffered from lead poisoning in 1923 and went to recuperate in Florida. The federal government was also hearing from concerned scientists and public health experts. In October 1922, chemistry professor William, William Mansford Clark wrote to A.M. Stimson, who was the assistant surgeon general at the Public Health Service, that TEL posed, quote, 
a serious menace to the public health. Clark correctly predicted that, quote, on busy thoroughfares, it is highly probable that the lead oxide dust will remain in the lower stratum. After reading Clark's letter, Stimson concluded that the possibilities of a real health menace do exist in the use of such a fuel, and it is deemed advisable that the Public Health Service be provided with some experimental evidence tending to support this opinion. He requested that the Division of Chemistry and Pharmacology investigate the issue. However, the director of the division declined, claiming that such trials would be too time consuming and suggested that the lead industry itself could provide the needed information about potential health risks. So then there's a bunch more um, uh, quotes from people expressing their concerns. Um, and then it goes on. The Public Health Service had declined to study the issue, but the Federal Bureau of Mines agreed to carry out a study funded by General Motors itself. The Bureau of Mines was widely known to be a pro-industry agency, and that reputation was certainly borne out by the terms that they approved for their study of tetraethyl lead. They agreed to refer to the compound only as ethyl, leaving out any mention of lead. The study would focus primarily on the safety of the workers producing TEL, and not on issues relating to the general population and the use of TEL in gasoline. In addition, GM reserved the right to approve any results before they were published, effectively giving themselves veto power over the entire study. Um, this was, needless to say, this was not the kind of unbiased, wide-ranging study that public health experts had been looking for. Dr. Yandel Henderson, a professor of applied physiology at Yale University and a chief scientific advisor to the Workers' Health Bureau, was asked to assist the Bureau of Mines with their study, and he wrote back to state his terms. I should be glad to investigate the physiological and sanitary questions concerned, but only on the assumption that so terrible a poison as tetraethyl lead should not be introduced until absolute proof is available that no danger to the public would be involved. Dr. Henderson was not invited to participate in the study after all. While the Bureau of Mines study was underway, production and marketing of ethyl began in earnest, and the very first gallon of leaded gasoline was pumped on February 1st, 1923, at a gas station in Dayton, Ohio. Originally, TEL was sold as a dark red fluid that the gas station attendants would mix into the gasoline right there at the pump. Ethyl was a big hit. Drivers found that it did indeed stop knocking, as well as increasing the power of their engines and improving their fuel efficiency. In some of the newer cars with their high compression engines, the increased octane of the leaded gasoline allowed people to drive as much as 50% farther on a gallon of gas. Within 18 months, ethyl gas was being sold at 10,000 gas stations in 27 states. Leaded gasoline was a big success at the pumps, but in the factories producing the TEL, things started to go catastrophically wrong. DuPont had managed to cover up the earlier deaths of several workers at two of its TEL plants but a series of grisly deaths in 1924 at their Elizabeth, New Jersey plant made headlines. Five workers died and 35 others experienced the convulsions and hallucinations associated with severe lead poisoning. One employee had to be subdued by three strong men before he could be taken away in a straitjacket. Lurid newspaper coverage of the violent insanity of the poisoned workers, the fumes in the factory referred to as loony gas, raised immediate public concern. Health experts took the opportunity to point out that, with leaded gasoline already being pumped into gas tanks around the country, it wasn't just industrial workers who were at risk. Dr. Yandel Henderson, the Yale physiologist who had declined to participate in the Bureau of Mines study, told the New York Times, this is probably the greatest single question in the field of public health that has ever faced the American public. Soon, New York City, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and the state of New Jersey had banned all use of TEL in gasoline. The day after the fifth worker died in Elizabeth, New Jersey, the results of the questionable Bureau of Mines study were released, and unsurprisingly, the study found no health hazards associated with ethyl. This result was criticized by numerous scientists, public health experts, labor activists, and at least one competitor of General Motors. Six months after the release of the Bureau of Mines study, in May 1925, the Surgeon General convened a conference on TEL in Washington, D.C. The 87 participants included public health experts and labor advocates, as well as representatives of the oil and automobile industries. So I'm going to skip ahead here. It talks a little bit about what both sides said at this conference, but I want to read a long quote from um, 
Frank Howard of Standard Oil, because I think it so beautifully encapsulates the kind of perspective of the oil and automobile industry executives who went to this conference to argue that they should be allowed to continue to produce tetraethyl lead. Here's what Frank Howard had to say. <clears throat> we cannot quite act on a remote probability. We are engaged in the General Motors Corporation in the manufacture of automobiles and in the Standard Oil Company in the manufacture and refining of oil. On these things, our present industrial civilization is supposed to depend. I might refer to the comment made at the end of the war that the Allies floated to victory on a sea of oil, which is probably true. Now we have this apparent gift of God of three set cubic centimeters of tetraethyl lead, which will permit that gallon of gasoline to go perhaps 50% further. What is our duty under the circumstances? Should we throw this thing aside? Should we say, no, we will not use it in spite of the efforts of the government and the General Motors Corporation and the Standard Oil Corporation toward developing this very thing, which is a certain means of saving petroleum? Because some animals die and some do not die in some experiment, shall we give this thing up entirely? Frankly, it is a problem that we do not know how to meet. We cannot justify ourselves and our consciences if we abandon the thing. I think it would be an unheard of blunder if we should abandon a thing of this kind merely because of our fears. So I really learned a lot researching this about the perspectives of the two different sides back in the 1920s arguing about whether we should have leaded gasoline. Clearly the public health experts already knew what kind of health issues we were facing, but they got shouted down by the industrialists who said, we need this. Um, there was actually concern at the time in the 1920s that the US was on the verge of running out of petroleum, which is a little weird for us to think about now, but some of the big oil fields that you know we pumped throughout the 20th century hadn't been discovered yet. And so people thought, oh no, we're running out of oil. Here's a way to make that oil last longer, right? And eventually at the end of this conference in 1925, it was decided that there would be another study, but they gave the group doing the second study only six months to complete it. After six months, they said, here, I'll skip ahead to that part. Um, oh, it was seven months. After a mere seven months, the committee re released a report that found no good grounds for prohibiting the sale of leaded gasoline. In reporting the committee's findings, the New York Times ran the headline, report, no danger in ethyl gasoline. However, that's not exactly what the committee's report said. In fact, the report specifically noted that, quote, it may, remains possible that if the use of leaded gasoline becomes widespread, conditions may arise very different from those studied by us, which would render it more of a hazard than would appear to be the case from this investigation. Longer experience may show that even such slight storage of lead as was observed in these studies may lead eventually in susceptible individuals to recognizable or chronic degenerative diseases of a less obvious character. Along with issuing their report, the special committee passed a resolution calling on the public health service to conduct further studies, arguing that it should be possible to follow closely the outcome of more extended use of this fuel and to determine whether or not it may constitute a menace to the health of the general public after prolonged use or other conditions not now foreseen. However, the Public Health Service ignored this recommendation and did not continue the work begun by the special committee. In fact, no serious government research on the health effects of leaded gasoline would be carried out for the next four decades. And just like that, Standard Oil gas stations all over the country put up signs proclaiming that ethyl is back. In one small concession to worker safety, TEL was now mixed into gasoline at the refineries rather than at the pumps. American cars became bigger, faster, and more powerful, and used more and more leaded gasoline. By 1936, around 90% of gasoline sold nationwide was leaded. The amount of lead that Americans were putting into their gas tanks would climb steadily across the decades until, by the early 1970s, over 250,000 tons of lead per year were being added to gasoline in the United States. Most of the lead that's pumped into gas tanks eventually comes out of tailpipes in the form of airborne lead containing chemicals. The air and soil throughout the country would come to contain higher and higher concentrations of lead over the decades. 
and so with the children. So chapter two is kind of a downer, but chapter three is very inspiring. It talks about the scientists and advocates who worked really, really hard starting in the 1950s and through the 60s and into the 70s to get the lead out of gasoline and the triumph of removing the lead from American gasoline such that by the mid 80s, it was almost entirely gone. By the mid 90s, lead was banned completely from any on-road vehicle use. Um, and, that, and, and in tandem with that reduction in leaded gasoline, um, we can really see a reduction in blood lead levels across the country. So uh, yeah, I ended on kind of a down there, but wait till you read chapter three, very inspiring. So that's, um, that's kind of an overview of sort of some of the things I learned in writing the book and some of the things that I wrote about. Uh, but I really wanted to have time for some discussion. So I think that this is probably a small enough group that we can mm -hmm. ask questions. And to avoid the technological issues of Facebook, I'm gonna suggest that if you have a question, just raise your actual physical hand <laughs> in front of the camera, and then I will be able to call on you. Um, and, and you can ask me anything you want. Kerry, I wondered what worked best in advocacy in terms of um, having the lead removed from the gas. What, what seemed to be effective in, in terms of uh, people fighting for this? Oh, that's industry such a great, is tough to beat, yeah. That's such a great question, because yeah, the industry continued to be nefarious throughout the whole process. Um, I argue in the book that it took a combination of scientists, activists, and um, well-meaning um, regulators within the government to get the job done. Uh, I don't think any of those three groups could have made this happen on their own. So you have scientists um, doing really good research showing how much lead people are being exposed to and the specific harms that that lead is doing, especially to children. Um, you have activists getting the word out. Um, they had to overcome a real um, sort of stereotype that lead poisoning was a ghetto issue, um, which was, was actually discussed at the time and, and show that actually it was harmful to all of our children. So I think that helped to bring people together. Um, and then there's a really inspiring story of, um, so we started phasing lead out of gasoline and then they elected Ronald Reagan president. So suddenly we have a very anti-regulatory administration in Washington and they uh, were basically walking back the phase out of leaded gasoline. And they asked an economist in the uh, EPA to calculate the costs of getting lead out of the gasoline. How much is this going to cost the oil companies if we force them to meet these, these um, targets of the phase out of leaded gasoline? And he figured if he was going to add up the cost, he was going to add up the benefits as well. And it's widely considered to be one of the first cost benefit analyses of a major environmental legislation. And he was able to show that the cost would so be so dwarfed by the benefits that even other folks within the Reagan administration said, wow, I guess we should go ahead with this. It's a good deal for our country. So I think it took all three of those sort of categories of people working together, the scientists, the activists, and the regulators um, to, to make this happen. Thank you. Yeah, all right. I saw Bruce next and then we'll come to Pam. You have to unmute, Bruce. Thank you. There you go. Uh, you're slow on the trackball here. Okay. Um, I was wondering, Carrie, in addition to activists working to change the laws or to make laws against the uh, the oil companies, um, were there any developments in the manufacturing or the technology of making motors that made it would have made it easier for automobiles? Um, to not need or lead, um, could they, I mean, they don't knock nowadays, do they? No, and, and I think this is a really interesting question because in some cases, we're able to address environmental problems by technological advances, right? As um, 
renewable energy is becoming more inexpensive and widely available that helps us to move away from fossil fuels that sort of thing but in this case that's not what happened we already had these other ways of increasing the octane of gasoline way back in the 1920s so i mentioned um um Oh, the term just went right out of my head. I'll come back to that. I mentioned ethanol, right? So we already knew that you could add ethanol to gasoline to raise the octane. GM just didn't want to do that because you can't patent ethanol and nobody's going to get rich selling booze for your gas tank. But you might notice now some gas stations, you know, the pump says may contain up to how many ever percent ethanol because that's one of the solutions that we switched to. Uh, thermal cracking is the term I lost for a minute there. Um, is a method of that involves um, some engineering that I'm not actually that familiar with, but it basically involves heating up the gasoline and exposing it to uh, certain conditions that change the hydrocarbons that make up the gasoline, and that also results in higher octane. And and people knew that back then. So probably thermal cracking has become more efficient and less expensive than it was in the 1920s, but it wasn't a novel technique. We had these other techniques. GM, I'll tell you, one of the um, one of the things that I really changed my mind about in writing this book is the culpability of the the folks involved in the Ethel Corporation in the 1920s. I really went into it with this theory that these weren't bad guys, right? They were just trying to run their company and and you know make life better for their employees and you know the justice in the American way. Um, but it turns out they 100% knew that there were these other options. And they went to this conference in 1925 in Washington, DC and said that there are not. They actually said in this conference, there's no other way to achieve this increase in octane that we can use except for this tetraethyl lead. And so we're going to have to use it. And we have internal company documents that show they knew that wasn't true. They knew they were lying. So I always try to push back when my students want to um, characterize co big companies as evil, right? Oh, it's just the evil, greedy corporations. I like, oh, no, they're just responding to economic incentives and they're making products we all use. So we're all culpable to some degree. It's, boy, some of these guys who <laughs> lied about the need for leaded gasoline, they, they were pretty nefarious because we had other options even back then. Yeah. Pam, did you have a question? Pam, you have to unmute. I know, I know. Um, so Bruce asked <laughs> my question, but but you, this this story is amazing that you tell, and it it makes me sick because I'm seeing these echoes as I'm learning about fracking and I'm learning about what is it? The you know the 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 chemicals from. Um, DuPont, et cetera. This is, this is a story that we keep seeing because of capitalism. There's, there's no question to me. But I have a very personal question, Carrie, since, since Bruce asked mine, and that is, so I was born in 1958. I mean, I must be incredibly toxic with lead. I grew up in Los Angeles. Um, and you talked about violence. OK, sometimes I get really pissed. But <laughs> What are the other things um, that we're seeing and what's the long-term implications for all of us who've been poisoned by, by lead? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, nationwide, we think that probably um, blood lead levels in kids yeah. peaked in the late 60s and early or early 70s. So you were a little ahead of the worst of it, but then being in LA, you were probably <laughs> worse than average for the country just because of the number of cars and trucks. Um, one of the things that makes this issue hard for us to think about and talk about and is true for many other environmental issues is that there's a lot of variability in how lead affects people right and so it's really hard just by knowing how much lead somebody was exposed to you can't do a good job making predictions for that individual in terms of their outcomes right uh, we know that in general um, exposure to lead reduces IQ, um, increases the incidence of behavioral problems and um, attention deficit disorder and hyperactivity. Um, but those are at the population level, right? Um, 
at the individual level, there's a lot of variability. So the analogy that I find helpful here is smoking and lung cancer, right? We know that on average, the more you smoke, the more likely you are to have lung cancer. But we also know that there are examples of people who smoke two packs a day for 50 years and never got lung cancer. And we know that there are examples of people who've never smoked a cigarette in their lives who do come down with lung cancer. So we can make these really um, fairly precise population predictions, right? On average, if this large group of people is exposed to X amount of lead, we would expect to see Y reduction in IQ scores, for example. But on an individual level, there's so much variability that we can't say anything. So you, Pam, personally, may not have been especially affected by lead. Or maybe you were, right? Maybe you would have been even smarter and calmer if you hadn't been exposed to all that lead. On an individual level, it's just really hard to say. And I think that for a lot of us who are trying to fight environmental harms, this variability is a real challenge in communicating about those harms, right? Um, you'll have somebody say, well, I, I was exposed to that chemical and I'm fine, right? As though that undermines it. Or you'll have, um, there was a, a great example of, um, you know, a company that had dumped, uh, I think it was TCE uh, it, in the ground and then it got into the well water and the kids were drinking it and there was this spate of illnesses and the company fought back against the lawsuit by showing all these other things that could cause those illnesses, right? Like, oh, well, do you have any plastic in your home? Uh, do you wear synthetic fiber? Like all these other things. And it, it's hard for us as humans to wrap our brains around these complex issues where many different factors contribute to the outcome and where even though we can say a lot about hazards on a population level, we don't really know how much effect they have on an individual level. So that's a challenge. Um, let's see, Bob, you can go next and then we'll go to Jenny. Except it's me, it's not Bob. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie, that was such a wonderful presentation and what a great study you did there. The only thing I'm aware about in lead poisoning, especially in children, was with the paint. Now, how does that relate to lead in paint? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we know that lead poisoning is cumulative, meaning that all the lead from any source that you're exposed to, it all adds up, right? And so throughout most of the 20th century, kids were being exposed to lead from paint and gasoline and leaded pipes. And in many cases, the solder that was used to hold food cans together, right? If you bought canned food, it was, those cans were made with lead right. solder. There were also some lead-based uh, pesticides that were in use. So all these different um, sources of lead add up. So the pattern is uh, the amount of lead in paint in the United States peaked in about the 1920s. At that time, a lot of interior wall paint was 50% lead, right? If a, if a flake chipped off the wall, that flake was 50% lead by weight, right? So that was really dangerous. And then over time, other pigments became more common. During World War II, the lead was needed for ammunition, so paint actually declined in lead content. Lead paint wasn't banned until the 1970s, but by that point, the amount of lead in paint had already come down a lot. Now, unlike gasoline, you don't see a quick uh, response to removing, to, to no longer making lead paint because paint stays on the wall for a really long time. So all the houses that were painted before the 1970s could potentially still have lead paint on them. So which is a long way around to answering your question, which is that throughout the 20th century, there was a long, slow, not nearly fast enough decline in the amount of lead that children were exposed to from paint, right? So a little bit lead in the 60s, less in the 60s and the 50s, a little bit less in the 70s than the 60s and so on. Meanwhile, leaded gasoline had this big rise and then very steep fall, right? So you can imagine that rise and fall superimposed on this long, slow decline. And so while lead 
Well, paint has always been an important source of lead exposure for children and continues to be to this day. Right now, lead paint is the main source of, of childhood lead exposure. It didn't follow this dramatic rising and falling pattern. And so a lot of the sort of dramatic changes that we see in childhood lead exposure during the 20th century were because of changing amounts of leaded gas. Thank you. All right, I think I said Jenny could go next. You, you did, but um, that was my question. It was lead paint, <laughs> so <laughs> thanks. Ah, all right, I saw another hand before. Who else had a question? Jean. I, I actually had the same question, leaded paint, you know, which as you've uh, amplified or explained, uh, has a long tail and uh, would continue to harbor, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the poisoning, you know, for children who like might enjoy chewing on a windowsill that's been painted uh, with lead paint and then may maybe in time painted over with unleaded paint. But, you know, if you chew on, um, on a surface that's, been previously painted with lead paint, you're going to get the lead paint, even though um, subsequent coatings were with unleaded paint. Yeah, I have actually two thoughts about that. One is back in the sort of 60s and 70s, uh, when the issue of banning lead paint was being discussed, um, there was still this idea that lead, exposure to lead from lead paint was mostly kids eating the paint right, or chewing on fixtures that, that were painted. We now know that a lot of that exposure actually comes from dust, right? As the paint breaks down over time, it, it forms dust and the dust gets on all the surfaces in the house and little kids crawl all around and touch everything and then put their fingers in their mouth. Um, I remember when I was helping to test for lead in the 1990s, we had these information sheets we would give to parents when we found high levels of lead. <laughs> it talked about things like uh, wet mopping, right, to pick up the dust. Um, and one of the recommendations that was still being made at that point, and I am ashamed to have participated in telling parents this, was to uh, try to keep your kids from putting their fingers in their mouth. But you can't keep kids from putting their fingers in their mouth. It's a, it's a it's a instinctive behavior. Kids put their fingers in their mouth before they're born, right? You can see it in those cute little ultrasound pictures. So um, understanding that it's not just hunks of paint, it's dust, and understanding that if the dust is around, it's going to get into the kids. There's no amount of supervision that's going to make that not happen. Um, has has really I think changed some of our thinking about lead paint. But the other issue I wanted to mention about lead paint, and since this is an environmental justice group, this is something that's a really strong theme in the book that I haven't talked about, is the, the racial justice issue. So we know that today, the kids who live in neighborhoods with old housing that hasn't been you know, fully renovated in the way that might eliminate old lead paint tend to be black kids, right? They're, they're inner city locations. Um, and statistically speaking, black kids are exposed to much more lead from paint than white kids. Also, where are the lead pipes? They're in the older inner city neighborhoods, right? The newer suburban neighborhoods don't have lead pipes. And so that's another source of exposure that shows real racial disparity. Well, it turns out leaded gasoline also showed this very serious um, racial disparity that goes back to um, housing discrimination, right? Um, the, the fact that Black Americans were much more likely than white Americans to live in these older inner city neighborhoods has, goes all the way back to redlining and the housing discrimination that was fully legal uh, through the first two thirds of the 20th century and then continued even once it was illegal later on. And the building of major roads and highways has also had a significant racial bias, right? When we built the interstate highway system, we, we had to build roads through people's neighborhoods, right? Part of the goal of that system was to get these highways into downtowns and downtowns were places where people already lived. So whose neighborhoods 
got these major multi-lane highways through them. Not wealthy white neighborhoods, right? It was mostly um, black and to a lesser extent Latino neighborhoods that ended up with all these cars and trucks. And so back when the cars and trucks were burning leaded gasoline, it was children of color who were most um, exposed to all that lead. So the racial justice issue is an important part of the book as well. And it's it was true for leaded gasoline. It continues to be true for lead paint and lead pipes. Um, and, and I think is something important for us to, to keep in mind. Other questions? Uh, Nula. I was wondering about other countries. You spoke about, you know, how it's outlawed here. I was wondering about Europe and then the global south and other countries. Yeah, that's a really good question. So Western Europe was about a decade behind us in getting the lead out of their gasoline. So it took them a little bit longer, um, but, but you know, by about a decade after we got the lead out of our gasoline, most of Western Europe had got the lead out of their gas. Interestingly, if you look at um, violent crime rates, you see that the big drop that occurred in the sort of late 90s here didn't start until about 10 years later in many of the countries in Western Europe. Um, but other places in the world continued to use leaded gasoline. And interestingly, last month, the United Nations announced that the very last gallon of legal leaded gasoline for on-road use had been sold and the whole world is now free from legally available leaded on-road gasoline for the very first time right now. Like it was maybe six weeks ago. So that is really exciting news. Unfortunately, so that's for on-road vehicles. Um, even here in the United States, there are still small aircraft that use leaded gasoline. Um, there are these small airplanes that were designed to use extremely high octane gasoline, not the kind that's in your car or even in like a fancy sports car, but like much higher. And they still use leaded gasoline. And there are kids, there, there are studies showing that the kids who live near the airports where that leaded gasoline is being used in these small airplanes have higher levels of lead in their blood than kids living in other neighborhoods in the same city. So. Uh, that's still an ongoing problem, but at least for cars and trucks, the whole world is now leaded gasoline free. I found it really interesting. You know, I've been researching this book for six years, so that was not true. When I started doing my research, there were still countries using leaded gasoline for cars and trucks at that time. And the list, when I mean, if you think about lead as a contributor to violence, the list of countries that were still using leaded gasoline at the time was like North Korea, Afghanistan, Iraq. Um, countries that we kind of associate with having violence going on in them. So, but that's no longer the case. So that's good. It is an example. Your your point about the global South is a good one. That that there were the, the American ethyl corporation was still selling leaded gasoline in parts of Africa decades after it was illegal here. So it's just one of those examples where we sent our environmental mess off to somebody else to deal with. But at least not anymore. Um, Jan. Speaking of an environmental mess, um, climate change comes to mind. And I wonder what you can tell us about the, the success of getting lead out of gasoline and how we might apply some of those principles to improving our, our climate change problem. I, I didn't actually pay him to ask that question, but it's a really <laughs> good question because I think, you know, there's a way in which the story of leaded gasoline is over, so why should we care? But I think there are some really important lessons that we can learn from the success that, that we can implement in the fights that we're still fighting, which especially climate change is obviously the big environmental challenge of our lifetime. And, um, so here are a few of the things that I think are relevant. One is when the corporations tell us that regulating them would be prohibitively expensive and economically disastrous, that's probably not true. That's what the oil companies said when they talked about taking lead out of the gasoline, that, that the economy would be devastated by this change. The price of gas would go through the roof and become unavailable and it would be terrible. And that's just not what happened by the second half 
of the phase out, um, gas prices had fallen through the floor and everyone was talking about this glut of gasoline. So we got to take those claims with a grain of salt because you see this now with climate issues, right? Companies saying, oh, if you if you impose this regulation on us, it will cost X dollars. And, and the you know scientists who study this say, no, it will cost about one hundredth of X. And and the certainly the story of leaded gasoline tells us that the corporate numbers were way way off. Um, I think that um, there are some ideas about communicating science that are definitely relevant. Um, both the issue of lead poisoning and the issue of climate change. Um, are, are these large scale issues that are kind of invisible chemicals, right? You can't actually see what's happening. We kind of depend on scientists to tell us what's going on. Um, and one of the things that we learned with the leaded gasoline is that um, it's not enough to just tell people the scientific results, that you have to really change attitudes about the issue, not just talk about the science. Uh, there are other great lessons. I see we're coming to eight o'clock, so I don't want to keep anybody up past their bedtime, but there are other great lessons in here, I think, that can be learned from the history of leaded gasoline and applied to contemporary problems, including climate change. But one of the biggest ones for me was don't give up. So mm -hmm. there were scientists in the 1920s who said leaded gasoline is a terrible idea and it's going to harm our country and the 30s and the 40s. And the 50s and 60s and it took until the 70s to actually get something done about it imagine being one of those anti-lead activists in those many decades it felt like you weren't making any progress and nobody was listening to you and nothing was ever going to get better and the amount of lead in our gasoline just kept going up and up and up and up but in the end they won right they got the lead out of gasoline my daughters are growing up way way less lead poisoned than i was because those folks didn't give up. They didn't say, forget it, we're not making any progress, let's not fight this fight. They kept on fighting. And so I wanna share something that this made me think of because this is a UU audience. Um, <clears throat> for me personally, studying the influence of childhood lead exposure on crime rates has highlighted the fact that in addition to policy changes, our country needs a change of heart. Millions of children's brains were damaged by a factor beyond their control in ways that have made it more difficult for them to learn, pay attention, and control their impulses. Um, no, that's not actually where I wanted to start. In the end, the story of the rise and fall of leaded gasoline is a story of amazing progress. The scientists and activists fighting against leaded gasoline knew that the free market alone could not solve the problem. So they went up against the powerful and well-funded industry to force the federal government to act. It took decades of hard work. The results, though far from complete, have been amazing. We got the lead out of our gasoline and more than 90% of the lead out of our preschool children. Today's children and young adults are healthier, smarter, and less violent than they would have been if not for this extraordinary effort. It was a long fight for the people involved, and there must have been times when it looked like they would not prevail. Industry lives were taken seriously, anti-lead research came under attack, Americans elected an aggressively anti-regulatory president. The switch to unleaded gas was never a foregone conclusion, but the country got there in the end. In the past few years, many activists have watched past successes be renegotiated, watched years of progress stripped away. Things can seem bleak. For me, researching the story of leaded gasoline has helped me to focus on the larger sweep of history. Many of us have heard Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s much quoted assertion that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Dr. King was paraphrasing a sermon by the 19th century Unitarian minister, Theodore Parker. Reverend Parker was a social justice warrior way back in the 1840s and 50s. According to his biographer, John White Chadwick, Reverend Parker was involved in a number of reform movements, including quote, peace, temperance, education, the condition of women, penal legislation, prison discipline, the moral and mental destitution of the rich, and the physical destitution of the poor. Most of all, he advocated for the abolition of slavery. Reverend Parker sheltered runaway slaves in his home, violating the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. He supported the abolitionist revolutionary John Brown, who was executed. 
Theodore Parker was a man who lived through challenging times for a cause he believed in, yet he did not give up hope. Dr. King's famous quote comes from the Reverend Parker's sermon, Justice and the Conscience, which he preached in 1852 in the midst of those dark antebellum years. Look at the facts of the world. You see a continual and progressive triumph of the right. I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by the experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience. And from what I see, I am sure it bends toward justice. It's easy for us to get caught up in the day-to-day -day struggle, keeping our heads down and our noses to the grindstone but it's important to look around once in a while and notice how far we've come. Learning about the story of leaded gasoline has convinced me that we must never give up hope. If the arc of the moral universe does bend toward justice, it doesn't bend on its own. It bends toward justice because so many people in the generations that came before us spent their entire lives pushing it in that direction. The arc of the moral universe bends toward justice because so many people get up every day and push for justice, we can carry the lessons of the past with us as we march toward a brighter future. So I put a little you, you in there. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. It's been so fun talking with everybody. I really appreciate it. If you have any other questions, you guys know where to find me. I'm always happy to talk about this stuff. And extra thanks to Ruth for organizing all of this. Um, I really appreciate it. It's been great. Carrie, thanks so much. Thanks, hey, for, Thank yeah, you. Not Thank only you. doing, not only doing the research, you know, but in sharing it with us tonight, it was wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was great. Thank you, Carrie. Well done. Thank you, Carrie. Good luck. Best wishes. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, Carrie. Bye. Bye. Congratulations. Night, everybody. Good night. Good night.